Okay, I think we're, I'm finally getting a live video. I'm going to make this video, I'm doing it on uh, live Facebook, but I'm going to post it on my YouTube channel, and I will put the URL link in on Blackboard. This is for the Music 110 class, so for my music students, music history. Um, if you're watching this video, I, I would suggest that you open up the PowerPoint that's, it's, I think it's PowerPoint 6, Lesson 6, the Middle Ages PowerPoint. Now, I haven't done any type of lectures to accompany the videos, but I wanted to do sort of an introduction. Most of the videos, I mean, pardon me, most of the PowerPoints are rather self-explanatory. But I know that my dual enrollment students, I don't think you've seen me at all. Uh, and so here's your opportunity to see who you're dealing with and who's talking to you via line, online. We have finished what I like to call uh, the tedious section of introduction to music. It deals with terminology. It deals a little bit with music theory, but as you know, I, I'm not trying to turn you into trained musicians. I'm trying to instill in you a simple appreciation of the challenge of music and the heritage of music. We are now beginning what I like to consider more of a history phase so we can see how music developed. And that's why I want you to look at the Middle Ages uh, video. I'm going to refer to it. I'm, right now I'm looking at the first slide which says the Middle Ages or Medieval Age, 450 to 1450. This is generally what's accepted as the first period of Western music. Uh, but I felt the need, and then you'll see this in the PowerPoint, to go back a little bit. So I'm going to go to the next slide. And um, you'll see a lovely picture well, you will, I'm not, um, of the Middle Ages. You can skip that. From there, your uh, third slide that you will see is a map. And oddly enough, the map shows the Roman Empire at its height. Now, usually somebody says, what's that got to do with medieval music? Uh, basically, I'm trying to give you the foundation of where our music came from. Prior to the 4th century, Rome was still an active power. Uh, Rome itself was divided into two kingdoms, the Western Empire the Eastern Empire. Western was Rome, Eastern was a place called Byzantium. We call it Constantinople. Today it's known as Istanbul. Uh, but this map shows you the extent of the Roman Empire. The reason I'm showing this is to let you know that this is what people refer to as the Middle East, North Africa, and the West, the European world, the Western music and what we call Western civilization developed here in what is today European countries, Italy, Spain, France, Germany, and England. And because of this, uh, we need to know what came before. And what came before was basically Rome. Rome was an assimilating empire. They would come in, they would conquer, and then they would assimilate the aspects of culture, and then they shared their culture. Uh, that's why even today you can go to Great Britain and parts of Germany and France and you'll find Roman ruins there. Uh, places like Roman baths where they shared these cultural things. Um, they taught a lot. Now, of course, Rome was very brutal, but that enabled them to conquer. And in conquering, they shared. Now, on the fourth slide, you see an image of what Rome looked like at its height. Uh, noticeably, you'll see the Circus Maximus, the Colosseum, and an aqueduct running through there. Rome was at the height of its civilization probably in the mid-first century. Second, third, and fourth century it began to wane due to internal corruption, things like that. But the culture stayed the same. Um, and when I talk about culture, I'm talking about things like arts and science and music, because that's what we want to look at. Rome was a very musical place. Because when they conquered a place, they would adapt that country's music. A lot of what we see in Rome is comes from the early Greek sounding music. The Greeks used a system of modes rather than what we call scales. And so we have a bit of an idea of what early music sounded like. But what you may be surprised to know is that prior to the 4th century, and really prior probably closer to the 6th century, 
we don't have a totally accurate way of understanding what music sounded like. We know the instruments that created it, but we don't know the notation that we used. We don't know what kind of phrasing and what kind of uh, tonality was presented in groups. Uh, we do know that Greeks use modes, and some of those modes have existed, so that's given us probably our best idea of what music sounded like. Um, the Romans would have adapted to that style of music. And the modal system, uh, it, it reflects a sort of a pentatonic scale, and you'll get minor sounds and major sounds. But as far as a 20th century major minor scale, uh, that was a later development. But that's what music was. Now, how did it happen? Uh, the next slide you'll see a picture of a Roman uh, group of soldiers. And the reason I put this in here is to show you that Rome was still foremost a military dictatorship. Uh, the things you'll see, and this is, by the way, these are reenactors, but they're accurate in their depiction of Roman garb and dress. And what Rome did was they brought technology to warfare. It was more than just a bunch of guys running at each other and pushing and shoving and hacking each other to death. It was pretty sophisticated. Uh, one thing that you'll notice here, just to mention technology, you see the spear or the lance that those soldiers are carrying. Uh, early spears were broad beams of wood with a basic big arrowhead fixed to it. Romans came up with the idea of making the javelin type. It was thinner, lighter, and then they put a heavy lead extension for the tip, and the tip was smaller so that it could pierce armor. Um, again, it was an innovative way that you could use this to thrust, but you could also throw it further than your enemy could throw theirs. You see, they had armor. Now, most of the Roman armor was on the front of their bodies. They didn't armor their backs because... If you've got armor on your back, it may encourage you to turn and run away. So they didn't allow armor on their back. They would have a leather piece to, to a, a gird a, a bodice, I'm sorry, a bodice to gird their body. Uh, but most of the armor was placed in the front, so the soldiers would remain front. They wore helmets with protection for their neck to prevent back uh, attacks. The only thing missing in this picture, it's on the, the guy on the right with the brown thing on his head, uh, are the greaves, which are shin guards. And again, those shin guards only covered the front of the leg, not the back. So everything was done to produce an offensive nature. What you don't see here, and I think it's probably one of the most brutal things, is that when Romans were marching, they wore their shoes. But when they went into battle, they would affix claws on the bottom of their feet. Uh, sort of like the old-fashioned roller skates that kids used to attach to their shoes. Except these, they had curved and hooked claws. This was two reasons. Uh, the claws were used to sink into the ground so they could stand their ground. The other thing was that as they marched over an enemy, if he was still alive, they would simply rake it across his throat and kill him. So they were designed as killers. That's one of the reasons they were so successful. The next slide shows you a couple other things, such as the turtle that they used, where they would link shields above and on the sides, and they would advance an enemy with the guy on the second row pushing a spear forward, and the guy in the front row pushing his short sword forward. So, like I said, they were brutal, they were effective, and they conquered. The next slide, I think it's slide number seven, shows uh, what I call the degradation from within. I use gladiatorial combat. Something you probably don't realize is that the gladiatorial games were not always so bloodthirsty as they were in the later empire. In the beginning, as a matter of fact, gladiators were like professional athletes. We have found actual cards, wood and uh, some made of pottery, that have gladiators' names and a symbol for what weapons they used. And they, it appears they were traded almost like souvenirs, like kids today trade baseball cards and football cards. Gladiators look upon as heroes. Uh, some of them were professionals, some were slaves, some were prisoners. Uh, the arena is often misunderstood. A typical day at the arena would be you go in the morning and you'd watch some executions and after lunch they would have people come in and they would bring wild animals and let them be eaten by animals. And the afternoon and evening was reserved for professional fights. And sometimes it was group fights, sometimes it was reenactment of battles, sometimes it was one-on-one. -on -one or one or multiple partners. So, But what this led to was sort of a bloodthirsty society. The, the more advanced they became, 
it seemed like the more they degraded themselves in their desire for blood, and it weakened the empire. Uh, the next slide is slide eight, shows you the ruins today of the Roman Forum, if you were to go and visit there. I'll show you this just to look at the architecture and realize that they worked on a massive scale. They were excellent engineers. Uh, then I have a slide talking about the division of Rome. Uh, it was the center of the empire. You can see that the fall of Rome can be traced back to certain dates, but it's hard to say that on this day, Rome failed because Rome was sacked by several barbarians. Uh, but usually they would come, take stuff, and leave. Most notable was Alric, who was uh, a barbarian from Eastern Europe, and he and his sons came in. They sacked Rome for three days, took a bunch of stuff, and left. Uh, later, they would come back and actually assimilate into Rome. And so you had a mixture of barbarian and Roman citizen at one point. Look on this slide and you'll see that in 306 AD, Constantine, who was a Greek slash Roman general, became the emperor of the Eastern Empire. Constantine fought a battle and the legend is that in the midst of the battle he was losing, he asked his men, he said, well, you know, did we sacrifice to the gods? And someone said, yeah, we well, sacrificed to all the gods except for the Christian God. He said, well, quick, sacrifice to the Christian God. And supposedly, as the legend is, that when they did that, he saw a cross in the, sky, in the sky and he heard a voice say, by this symbol you will conquer, and he won the battle. After that, it took several years, uh, he allowed Christianity to be the official religion of the Eastern Empire. And not too long after that, the Western Empire would adopt the same stance. We hear a lot about persecutions and stuff, but there was never wide-scale uh, total empire persecution. It popped up in various places. Christians were persecuted and massacred and martyred. Um, but usually it's like in Rome and then it was in Syria and then other places. Uh, so history is a little more complex than just a simple snapshot like I'm trying to give you. But this is important when Byzantium, or later Constantine named it after himself, Constantinople, accepted Christianity. It allowed Christianity to spread more freely. Uh, now, notice the next slide. Slide 10 says Christianity comes to Rome. What I wanted to point out here was uh, this is how Rome began to adopt Christianity. It's very important in our story about music. If you read this story, you'll see around 452, a guy named Attila, who was a Hun, uh, was conquering a lot in the north and outside of Italy. Uh, he had a pretty good track record. He was destroying Roman legions left and right. He finally turns attention to Rome, and he comes into Italy uh, with the intent of going to destroy Rome. Now, um, he was wanting to marry a woman named Honoria. She was the sister of Emperor Valentinian III, and that would give him a legitimate right to rule Rome uncontested. Uh, the emperor refused. Instead, the emperor sent, and I, I put Pope Leo I, he wasn't called the Pope yet. He was just the Bishop of Rome, but later he will be called the Pope. Uh, but he sent Pope Leo I, the proconsul of Ennius, and the prefect of Rome to meet and discuss this with Attila. They met near Mantua. Nobody knows exactly where. And there, the story is that the prefect and the council of Ennius decided they didn't want to talk to Attila. But Leo went out, riding on a donkey, carrying a cross, and he met Attila in the middle of a field on his war horse carrying a sword. They adjourned over to a nearby tree, and like I said, all this is more anecdotal and legend, but they sat there and spoke for a couple of hours. And when they were finished, Leo went back to the Romans, Attila went back to the Huns, and Attila gave the order to turn around. They were leaving. And so they left Italy. They went north, um, I think they went to France, southern France, where they wiped out another legion. Uh, and somewhere along the way, Attila's two sons murdered him. Now, a lot of legends there. One says it wasn't his sons, that it was a concubine who had, he had conquered her and killed her family and she poisoned him. Another says that the sons killed him while he was worshiping the Christian God. Um, we don't really know for sure. The, the story of the poisoning is probably more accurate. Uh, because there's no record of Attila ever becoming a Christian. That was, again, more legend. 
But when the two sons killed their father, then rather than one taking over, they squabbled, and it pretty much ended the Hun threat as they went back. Now, Leo goes back to Rome, and the two guys, Avinius and the prefect, say, well, St. Peter and St. Paul were there to help him, and he saved us. They weren't there. They don't really know what was said. You know, uh, Pope Leo could have said, you know, Rome's not got any money, and there's nobody there. He might as well go home, and he may have left. Um, we're not sure, but what happened was that Leo is given credit for saving Rome. And then Leo, like any good bishop, uh, he said, it wasn't me. It was God. God saved Rome. And so the people say, well, we need to worship this God. What can we do? Well, that was a dangerous thing. But you have to understand the political situation. The people were looking at Constantinople and seeing a a very powerful Roman city, and the Eastern Empire was more powerful than Rome at the time. And they said, well, how could this be? And somebody said, well, they worship the Christian God. And so that made it more desirable to accept Christianity. And Leo said, well, if you want to be Christians, you must accept Christ and do away with all these other gods. Now, see, Rome had a very open feel toward religion. You could worship anything or anybody as long as you paid your taxes and didn't cause problems. In the 60s and 70s and the second century, uh, Christians were persecuted usually because they were used as a scapegoat. If there was a problem, blame it on the Christians. Now the Christians had saved Rome and they were doing well in Constantinople. And so Rome becomes a Christian place. A lot of the temples were shut down. A lot of the false god idols were removed. A, a weird historical point, and this too may be more legend, was that uh, they asked Leo, he said, where do you want to set up the church? And he said, well, sort of like that temple over there. He chose the temple of Dagon, the fish god. And when he goes in, he chooses the staff of Dagon, which has a carved fish on it. He chooses some of the vestments. Uh, I know people look at the, the hat that the Pope wears, uh, there's two stories behind that hat. One is that it was uh, the fish head. And if you look at that hat from the side uh, and look at the top, it looks like it's a fish head pointing up with the mouth open. So some said, well, wait, that's a pagan hat. That's Dagon. Others said, no, the symbol of the fish was the early Christian symbol. When Christians were hiding, they would draw half of a fish, and the person they were talking to would draw the other half, and that knew you were talking to a Christian. So the fish was pretty much a Christian symbol uh, and not Dagon. But critics of Catholicism have often said uh, the Roman Catholics were worshiping Dagon, and he still carries the staff of Dagon. And one of the popes several years back actually pulled out that staff and decided to carry it because the pope gets to choose what staff he carries. And people had a fit. They said, oh, that's a pagan staff. But I, got, I digress. Rome becomes Christian. Now, does it save Rome from further sacking? No, not really. Uh, Rome begins to, I used to say, go down, fall, slowly but surely. But as a military force, it was dwindling. But as an economic and still as a, I guess you say an economic empire, it was still going on. The Roman Empire will last for centuries. Um... Uh, it will stop to be a cover, but they had pretty much conquered. When Hadrian got to England and built that wall, he said, this is the end. This is as far as we go. When they conquered uh, the Germanian tribes, they said, this is as far as we go north. And they didn't want to conquer Africa because it was a desert. They got to the east. They conquered Israel and those areas along the coast. And they found that the further in they went, the places like what today is Iraq, Afghanistan and Persia, they ran into to groups called the Parthians, the Scythians, who were really tough warriors. At one point, um, a guy named Crashless lost 10,000 men in one battle, one of the worst defeats the Romans had ever had. Uh, so they decided, well, that's the end of the empire there. Uh, they even paid tribute for the Parthians to, and the Scythians to leave them alone. So that's the extent of the empire. Now it's a time for Christianity to spread. And with that spread, you begin to get a mission movement as more Christians go north and south and they go around spreading Christianity. Christianity pretty much spread through the Middle East. Now it was spreading into Europe and to England, all the way to Ireland. With that came the adoption of communication through song. Now, uh, 
there's some historical highlights on slide 11. A lot of this stuff is in gold print. If you see gold print, you might want to take note of it because that may be a question for you. But you'll see the collapse of Rome. It brought about the medieval age or the dark ages, the time of migration, the age of faith, the age of chivalry. All these names were applied to this period because this period will last roughly a thousand years. And medieval is a term that is just what it sounds like. This is an age between two evil ages. The Roman age was evil and the Protestant Reformation and the Renaissance was considered rather evil by the church because it challenged their authority. It also called the Dark Ages because there was a lot of chaos as the power of Rome began to dwindle. Roman soldiers began to take up the sword and they became basically uh, high class robbers who would conquer a town and just move in and take over. It will be the church that will become the I guess you should say the arbiter between people and people of power as they say, okay, you guys have taken the town. Now be nice to the people and they will feed you. And if you protect them, so the men with weapons protected the people with plows and the people with plows fed the men with weapons. And you had what will be called number three there, the feudal system. And it worked. The problem with the feudal system is sort of static, uh, but you will end up with three definite classes of people. You have the peasants and the nobles and then in between is the clergy. Uh, the clergy then ushers in what they'll call the age of faith. And then the, you'll see three things in particular that the clergy takes over. They, first of all, they take over all education. Uh, there are no schools anyway. And, and so people who want a formal education, they start with the nobles, educating their children, teaching them to read and do math and stuff, and also to sing. Because in worship, chanting was or what they considered singing, was an act of worship, so the nobles learned that. Eventually, they will teach that to the peasants, but it takes a while. They also take over the idea of architecture, what they brought from the Romans. The Romans were excellent architects, and so they begin to build churches. During this period, you'll have the age of cathedrals, where they build these massive churches. And then finally, the third thing you see is art and music. The church will control all art and music. Um, singing was something that was not encouraged because singing might lead to, I guess you say, secular thought. Uh, love songs, no. Only love songs should be a song to Mary or to Jesus or to God. So worship became the center of people's lives. Uh, this is a static style, but it ensconces, I think that's the right word, uh, but it ensconces the idea of music being controlled by the church and certain types of music. And We'll talk about that. You notice also six and five, six and seven. This is a period of the Crusades uh, in the 11th century when uh, the Pope says Deus Volt, which means God wills it, and we went on a series of rescuing the Holy Land, which was pretty much a big mistake. But one historical fact that's not covered real well is they felt like the Saracens, which is just their name for Muslims, were trampling over the holy sites. The truth was the holy sites had only recently been cited. Uh, Constantine's mother went and decided where the crucifixion was, where Jesus was born. Uh, it may not be correct. If you go to Israel today, you can visit all these places, but there's nothing to guarantee that that's actually where it happened. Uh, there's even argument over where the crucifixion was. There's Golgotha outside the city, and then there's the church of where Golgotha supposedly is. But we won't get into that. Uh, the reason I bring up the Crusades is they had a very strong impact on music. Crusaders went to the Middle East. They fought, they died, they killed. Uh, they came home pretty much, I guess as a disenchanted with church. The Muslims were supposed to fall on their swords and die. They didn't. Uh, Crusaders were told that if you take the cross and go fight for Christ, you cannot die and you'll always have victories. Well, their first battle was a, a loss. They did some brutal things. It was not a religious war. Some people said, well, those mean old Christians, but they forget that the Christians had, I think, roughly six crusades, and they came in response to almost 1,100 invasions by Muslim armies, some as far as Paris. Uh, the Muslims took Spain and held it for one time. They moved all the way into France. They invaded all the way to Vienna. So I, I don't like it when people say, well, crusaders were the brutal people that they were. They were brutal, but they were fighting more of a defensive war because Islam was trying to spread. Islam has the same idea that they need to conquer the world, that Christians felt they need to save the world. So 
know your history. <clears throat> Later on in the 13th century, before this Middle Ages ended, we fell into the Hundred Years' War, where you had English Christians fighting French Christians, and it was brutal. And one of the things that brought that to an end, not the thing, but was the bubonic plague or the Black Death. After that, we will have a period which we'll talk about later. It's the Renaissance and then Protestant Reformation. But this just sort of gives you a, a general highlight of where we're going. Now, I talk about the Crusades, even though that's not about uh, understanding, but I list them all on slide 12, just so you, a matter of information. But know that the Crusades served the purpose of music in that when they went to the Middle East, they came back not only with trophies of war, but with instruments, with new songs, a new style of writing music. And a lot of it was beautiful stuff. Poetry and love songs, which had been forbidden by the church, now are being sung openly. And you have what's known as a troubadour movement. And people have wondered, who were these troubadours? Well, the best guess is that these are guys showing up. They're being followed by gypsies. Uh, they're riding horses. They've got money. So in all likelihood, they were nobles coming home from the wars. But they had put away their sword now and taken the lute and other instruments. They were singing love songs. They were welcomed into castles to entertain. So that, again, tells me these were more than just simple soldiers. Uh, these were well-to-do people. They did bring gypsies with them. Gypsies were in Romania. When they went to the Holy Land, the gypsies followed them. Uh, one priest said, we're losing battles because there's prostitutes in the camp, and he sent all the women home. Well, they came back. And when the soldiers went home, they went back through Romania, they, and gypsies followed them. Gypsies followed where the money was. And that's where gypsies spread all the way to Western Europe. But with them came a whole new style of music, different instrumentation, and dancing. All of these things play a part in early music. Now, on slide 13, you will see musical characteristics. Look at those. This is the early part of the church period. Acceptable music was chant music, which is pretty boring. Uh, the only musicians allowed were priests at that time. This is the 4th, 5th, and 6th, all the way up to about the 10th century. Uh, the male voice was dominant. Women, you weren't allowed to sing. In some places, you weren't even allowed to go to church. If you did go to church, you had to stand in hallways off to the side where men couldn't see you and be distracted, distracted by your beauty. But you couldn't sing. Uh, the only singers were men and children sang the female part before their voice changed. Um, vocal music was the main form of expression because instruments were frowned upon in the early church. They thought they led to too much rhythm and dance. Uh, later, the organ will make its way into the church uh, because they didn't want to remind them of, say, here's pagan rituals. But remember, the main purpose of music wasn't for entertainment. It was to worship. Uh, I do like to point out something here. The idea, when the plague came about, uh, families, this may sound gross, but it's, I think it's important to understand that women weren't singing. They were starting to, but they weren't singing a lot. And so a lot of the priests uh, had to use children to sing the female part. When the plague came about, people felt like the church was the safest place, particularly in monasteries. So families would literally castrate their young sons at birth and then give them to the church and say, this is a castrati. He will always sing as a woman. Well, the church wanted women singers, but they didn't want women. So a castrati was perfect. And what you had was a lot of children being mutilated for the sake of their voice because the parents thought at least they'll live through this plague. Uh, the sad thing was you know, the plague eventually did reach even into the monasteries. But just another side note to history that's sort of gross. At any rate, uh, that gets us up to the basic characteristics. The next few slides are just a series of showing you some illuminated text. And what illuminated texts were it was the writing of the Bible. It was hand done, and it was a piece of art. And also you see in these various slides, there's several of them, uh, the music they were using. And they used, first they used one line with one note, a noom. Remember the nooms we talked about? Uh, and then they began to move those lines about to designate pitch, and it became more sophisticated. Uh, I'm going to stop at slide 18. It talks about sacred music, and I'm going to stop there. This is just an introduction. I may come back and talk about this more, but a lot of this stuff, like I said, is pretty self-explanatory. But I did want to give you a heads up on 
where music came from before the church. And it was a culture of Greek and Roman and a sort of a blend of, of other cultures that the Romans brought in. The church will filter out some of that, but a lot of it it keeps. And probably, uh, and this is our best guess, probably they kept the idea of modality from the Greeks. And that's where we begin to get our idea of major minor tonality, uh, pentatonic scales, and eventually the full eight note or 12 note scale and things like diatonic scale. But I won't bore you with that right now. Uh, but this is just a little lecture. I hope you get a chance to watch it and follow along with your slides to give you an idea of where we're going. I'm going to stop here. I may come back and pick up with some more of this, but like I said, a lot of this is a guided study on your own. Uh, this is very much the way it used to be done in major universities. You would have a mentor who would point you in the direction and say, read this, study this, and we'll test on it. And you did a lot of the work. And that's sort of what we're doing here with this class. Uh, but I hope you're enjoying it. I hope you will enjoy this history section. I, I'm pretty sure you'll enjoy this more than you did learning the terms and, and some of that stuff that we've been doing the past several weeks. But good to talk to you. I'm glad to let you see me for a change. But uh, we'll be talking again, and I'll probably do another lecture or two before we go. But thank you. Enjoy this.